ES Audio. When a venture capitalist hits big with a company that seemed to come out of nowhere, it can feel like they're using some kind of a crystal ball, that they have magic abilities to spot where a potential huge name like, let's say, Deliveroo will come from and get in early. The reality is there's a bit more science to the decision making. What we saw was that when delivery was first kind of getting to market, all of a sudden you could buy a cheap Android phone that was pretty good for about 50 quid. And you had the ability of having, you know, a computer in every driver's pocket. And then you can make sure the drivers are a lot more productive. And, you know, that, that was the real question that we thought was was being answered, that the time was now. Rob Nyes is the co-founder of Hoxton Ventures and backing Deliveroo was one of their early successes. A decision made not just by looking at a smart idea for a company, but the world into which it was entering and assessing how that company was equipped to take advantage and change it. For any company in a sector, you look and say, you know, are these folks able to be among the top two or three in the world? Is there some edge that we think gives these folks the chance to be a, a winner and not just a local also ran? I'm David Marsden from the Evening Standard. Rob's going to be appearing at our SME Expo, which is being held at Excel London on April 25th and 26th. He'll be talking with a panel of experts about the tech of the future. So you can probably expect a lot of talk about chat GPT. We may as well start in that sector. What is the most exciting area that he's looking at for investment right now? You know, I, I think it's pretty broad. I mean, I, I hate to be tied down to any one area, but you know, I still think we're in the early days of, you know, the ability of having a essentially a supercomputer in your pocket to do amazing amounts of things. So, you know, things like generative AI have become really hot in the past six months where you can, you know, type in a few words and get a beautiful image that looks, you know, photorealistic and frankly, you know, the quality is probably improving, you know, twenty percent a month. So stuff like that's kind of tangible and real and interesting. But again, I think you're seeing kind of all parts of the world getting reinvented by software in different ways and people trying to find economies, whether it's using machine learning for simple things like data entry or whether it's using, you know, computing power to look at how proteins fold in, in the biology space. I mean, software is, you know, eating the world like Mark, I think Mark Andreessen says. I still think we're, we're in a, a rather interesting area where nearly every business I talk to or anyone I meet at, you know, the dad's nights at my my kid's school, you know, software is changing their business in some way, whether it's, you know, just basic SaaS stuff they're using or their core business is becoming digitized. You know, we're in a, a very interesting time. What happens when you have a lot of excitement over a sector like generative AI? What are the what are the risks that come from that? There's a, I think it's a it's a natural curve and you know kind of a default of capitalism that there's a a flood of money into any new sector. There's a, fl a flood of opportunists, some of them worthy, some of them just you know hangers on that see an opportunity in a sector. So you see a natural flooding of the market, you know, like with a gold mine, someone strikes gold and everyone comes from hundreds of miles around to try and mine it. Some get rich, some don't, you know, there's consolidation and, you know, some folks that are early and find the right ones, you know, do very well. There's always blood in the water of the ones that don't succeed that get rolled up. But you know, if you look at the the technology world, you know this happens once every you know year or two. And you know, if you look at quick commerce, that was the hot thing two years ago when everyone was doing a Gorillas or a Getir or one of those kinds of companies. And there was a rush of money, and then eventually, when things slow down or the money starts to to go away, either the companies are are self sustaining and in a good place, or more often than not. The tide goes out and you can see who who's swimming without clothes and then the companies have to consolidate or die. So in all of that, I'm going to use a Scottish word here, in all of that stramash, when there's so much stuff going on and you're looking at lots of different companies, lots of different companies are coming to you. How do you go, right, this looks like a healthy company, this one I'm not so sure about. What kinds of things are you looking for? It's never a perfect process, but you know, typically... We try and you know, get a sense of, do we think this is one of the teams that can compete with the best in the world? And I think you know, what's really changed, especially in the past decade, is that you know historically, you had sort of local maxima where someone would win the UK. Like if you think about eBay and auctions, you know this is like 20 years ago now, you know eBay kind of stayed in the US first, you know won the US, then they went out and sort of bought local winners in every market after a winner had emerged and they paid a, a fair enough price. So they went to Spain, you know they bought Gumtree here on the classified side. You know, I think nowadays, you know the, the playing field is really level. So if you're looking at a company and if you look at our portfolio, 
you know, like Dark Trace, for example, when we did that investment, you know, there were competitors in Israel and Seattle and a couple in Silicon Valley and, you know, one or two others in different parts of the US. And you know, I think for any company in a sector, you look and say, you know, are these folks able to be among the top two or three in the world? And do we think there's enough exceptional talent or skill or luck or ambition or data, depending on what, whatever the sector and, and company desires? Is there some edge that we think gives these folks the chance to be a, a winner and not just a local also ran? Is that edge, from your perspective, more likely to be the person or the books, you know, the accounting books? What's going to give a company the edge? Are you investing in people or companies? VCs always say, you know, you invest in the people. And I think yeah, that's a large part of it. But, you know, also I think that you invest in the product to some extent as well. That it, to me, it's people plus product that you can have. And when I say product, it, to be fair, it's kind of product market fit that you can have, you know, a great surfer on really lousy waves and they have a bad day and don't look very good. You can have an average surfer with perfect waves in Hawaii and they look like a, a hero. So, you know, I do think there's kind of a, a lower threshold that a founder has to be good enough to, to survive and, and hold their own in the surf. And, you know, a great surfer will do perfectly, but also you need to make sure you're surfing in an ocean where there are real waves. And I think oftentimes, you know, founders can be fantastic, but if there's no motion, you simply can't surf. And so some of the the disappointments have been companies where it's been you know, phenomenal founders, but the market's just not there. And no matter what they do, they can't make a market. So then they either have to pivot quickly and find a, a market that makes sense that might be adjacent or throw in the towel. And I think that that's the, the hard part is you have to make sure you're at the right place, right time with the right person that's, and they're all kind of above the threshold that's good enough. How's your surfing skills, Rob? Terrible, terrible. <laughs> I'm always, I'm always a, a nincompoop about it. The uh, When I lived in the West Coast for many years, the water's too cold out there, man. It's like, you know, the water's like 10 degrees and I'm not into, uh, I'm much more of a hot tub kind of guy. So I'm happy to sit, sit back with a beer in the hot tub versus go out in the surf. But being right place, right time, how far ahead of time are you looking? So everyone's looking at AI, everyone's looking at bio right now. Are you thinking, right, in a year's time, this is going to be hitting really big? Or do you or do you get taken by surprise? I think you always get taken by surprise. You know, no VCs can really see the future. All we can do are you know, surround ourselves with people in the industry that you know have a view, people that are deep in any domain space, and then kind of extrapolate on what we've seen before. So with with generative AI, for example, you know, it's clear to me that you know the pace of the underlying data quality is you know probably getting better at you know. 10 or 15% a week which means that if you're make if you're if you're a a maker of products so if you're making photos or whatever it is or you're making images of celebrities you know it's sort of like in the early computing days that when you bought a new Intel CPU you know it actually made a difference right going from a 286 to a 386 made everything faster and it made windows runnable so you, you want to sit on top of these platform gains where when you have the the Moore's law type gains where something is getting incredibly faster and cheaper, how do you take advantage of that and find a way of capitalizing on the fact all the stuff underneath you is getting cheaper and faster with every passing period? So I think a lot of it's, it's sort of that kind of assumption that what are you thinking about in terms of what's practical? How realistic is the um, you know, is the ability to capitalize on the underlying underlying technology? And then realistically, you know, do you have extra sauce that you can you can put on top that really brings you an advantage versus other people who are going to also be trying to ride the same kind of wave? One of Hoxton's most notable successes was probably in Deliveroo, which you guys spotted really early on. What caught your attention there? You know, what we really saw is, you know, and for every deal, we ask ourselves, like, you know, why, why now? What's changed in the market that makes this the time to surf in that market and and again sometimes you know there's commercial changes or some factors you know it's rare that a business pops out of nowhere and you know reinvent something without there being some kind of external rationale for why it's happening now um and what we saw with, with Silveru in the in the very early days was that if you think about the dot com boom and and all the crazy ideas back then you know there was a, a company called Cosmo in New York that was doing food delivery and it was really cool if you're wealthy in New York, you know, literally a guy on a bike had a pager, 
He got a page that said, call this number. He called the dispatch. Dispatch said, go to, you know, West 55th Street at the bodega, pick up, you know, this, that, and the other, and bring it to West 58th Street. And it worked, but it was really inefficient. And what we saw was that when delivery was first kind of getting to market, all of a sudden you could buy a cheap Android phone that was pretty good for about 50 quid, which was a real game changer because, you know, up until then, you know, to get a phone with an accelerometer and the ability to track, you know, to track everything very closely was pretty expensive. So all of a sudden you had the ability of having, you know, a computer in every driver's pocket. And then if you think about what makes any delivery business work, it's the, it's the volume of, you know, how many deliveries can you do per hour? So if you all of a sudden can keep track of the drivers very closely, you can route them, you can figure out when they're lost. You know, some of them may, you know, have poor language skills and get lost and don't know how to call for help or don't know how to S or don't have an SMS function in their phone or a WhatsApp function, whatever it is, all of a sudden with a cheap Android phone, you can make sure the drivers are a lot more productive. And you know, that, that was the real question that we thought was, was being answered, that the time was now because you could do a lot more on the software side. And it wasn't a very cumbersome process like pagers. It was down to the point of, you know, if a driver decides they want to stop off and have a cigarette, they can do that, but it's, it becomes obvious in the app that they're not, uh, you know, they're not working at that time. <laughs> I could do with a break myself. So let's do that. On to the ads. Go have a look at smexpo.co.uk where you'll find the lineup for the shows. People like previous guests on this podcast, including Deborah Meaden and Levi Roots. And you can see them all for free. smexpo.co.uk. And when you back a company like Deliveroo or any company, how involved do you then get in the future of that company and how that company is working? Or do you just go, we believe you, here's the money to make that thing happen? Or do you step in and go, maybe try this or look at this as- angle as well? Well, I think we we try and provide you know sensible feedback. But again, you know, as VCs, you know, we're we're by definition minority investors, so we don't really control the company in any meaningful way. You know, we have defensive provisions as board members often to protect the the value of the shares. But in general, I'd say that we hope that founders want to come to us to chat about things, but you know, it's, it's their business at the, at the end of the day, you know, we can raise our hands if, if we think we've seen the story before and, you know, mistake is being made or, you know, again, in, in a good functioning company, you know, usually our feedback is useful enough where the founders will come and say, Hey, you know, what do you think of this? Or who do you know in this space? We try and bring in people that we know that are going to be useful to the founder, whether it's a, a partner or an advisor or you know someone they, they can work with downstream in some way. But um, nah, I think at the end of the day, if you expect the, the success of a company to depend on you, it's probably a bad investment that frankly, you kind of want to invest with the sense of, you know, if I get hit by the bus tomorrow, the company will be just fine. You know, maybe I can create some some tailwinds, but you know, I'm not going to be the one that makes a difference in the company enough to to really say it makes a difference for an investor. So much of of VC investment is, I don't want to say a gamble because there's a lot more skill and thought and technique goes into this. You're not just chucking stuff at a roulette wheel, but there's so much uncertainty around it. Nothing is, is predictable. Are there times when it is easier for companies to get VC capital than other times and and where are we right now is it, it, it should people be going should be people be expecting to be welcomed with with open arms by venture capitalists right now in reverse order i mean i think we're probably in one of the the more difficult times right now that so i mean in general it's easy when there's a lot of money flowing into the market and so when when interest rates are low people are chasing yields so investors whether it's endowments or pensions or high net worths you know, they're looking for returns, which means money flows into more risky sectors. So, you know, if you look at the past, you know, the bull market from call it 2010 to 2021, you know, that was a pretty good time to raise. And, you know, every year in that process, it got better because there was more money coming into the market full stop. I think in today's market, you know, the amount of capital is drying up to some extent. It's still you know much better than it was. And, you know, there's far more capital in Europe than there was you know, five or 10 years ago, but, you know, the bar is, the bar has gone up. So for founders, I, I think expect that, you know, unless they have some other X factor, you know, be it, they have their own great network or they founded a company before. I mean, those are all things that sort of de-risk an investment. 
Yeah, I would expect that we're entering more of a bear market where, you know, terms aren't going to be as generous. Prices aren't going to be as high. they will be term. I mean, we're seeing term sheets come out. There's probably fewer term sheets than we would like, you know, compared to two years ago and the yeah, prices. So for us, you know, on one hand, you know, when we enter a deal, it's usually at the seed or sometimes the pre-seed stage, you know, so prices have come down a bit, but then also for us, you know, for our series A's and B's, those prices have come down a bit. So and we're still seeing lots of activity and again, lo- lots of good companies. And, and the other the other side of the coin is that, you know, people are getting laid off from Google and Facebook and all these bigger companies, which then creates the opportunity like you saw in, in 2001 you know, and two, where, so, you know, I was in Silicon Valley in 2000, I was at Intel and, you know, you saw that people that got laid off from jobs that were kind of cushy, all of a sudden were thinking about, hmm, I have to actually go out and work hard again. What should I do? And so, you know, I joined Google in 2004. And, and if you look at the the hiring quality, I mean, I think after the, the, the dot-com bust happened, they were able to hire amazingly good people that otherwise would have never really left their old jobs. And you know, these are people working at like Xerox Park that, you know, wrote Python, you know, the original language that all of a sudden were gettable. And so, so to me, that, that that's the market opportunity is that people that otherwise, you know, may have been at DeepMind and very comfortable there, all of a sudden feel like, oh, Google's doing a 20% reduction or whatever it might be. Maybe I should go think about working at Civility AI or doing something on my own. So yeah, any kind of volatility is an opportunity. Yeah, because there must be people with uh, unrealized potential out there, huge amounts of talent suddenly coming on the market and going, all right, let's have a think about this. Is that something they should do? Should people be thinking, do you know what? Do I need to join another company? Could I start something myself? I, I think you know, it's different for every person. I mean, you know, being a founder is frankly a, a, a shitty, thankless job. Toiling for five plus years on a, a shoestring budget with, you know, having to do everything from, you know, clean the kitchen and clean the toilets to doing the VAT returns and yeah, it, it's a thankless job. And, and many times it ends in failure, right? You know, probably, you know, eight times out of 10, it ends in something that goes bust. So so to me, it's a function of, as a founder, are you prepared to you know, take that five years of opportunity costs and, you know, look at the, the relative weighting of the upside, you know, versus going to work at a big tech company or doing something that's more safe? You know, it's harder as you have if you get older and have kids or a family, that makes it difficult. You know, when I started Hoxton with my partner in you know 2011, 12, give or take, you know, we both were were single and had the ability to go and you know travel on you know a moment's notice. You know, now I have little kids and it's a lot harder. So it's again, it's it's a function of you know, are you really willing to make the sacrifices? And you know, the upside can be phenomenal, and it's, you know, probably the single biggest way to create wealth, you know, to become a Jeff Bezos or whoever, that's probably the single best way to do it is, is found a company, but it comes with you know, high risk. I did want to ask you, why did you not just found Hoxton, but to go, I'm, I want to be a venture capitalist. I can't imagine, you know, when you were eight years old, you thought you were sitting there in your classroom going, oh, yeah, you know what, I'm going to be a VC. I think if you talk to people in the industry and nearly everyone kind of stumbles into it, you know, I think part of it was being in Europe that, you know, I came over here with Google for a while or for what I thought would be a short while um, and kind of saw the opportunity that the market, the talent was really good and comparatively compared to California, the density of capital available was really low. I joined Fidelity, who at the time it's been renamed Eight Roads now, but it was a earlier stage venture capital fund here in London. So kind of learned the ropes of venture. And, you know, frankly, it's a an interesting way of getting exposure to lots of ideas without having to to pick one necessarily. So, you know, if there's one thing I was absolutely passionate about, I probably ought to, you know, go found the company in that space. But it also it's also good for the for the ADHD sufferers that it lets you have a portfolio of lots of different things to to focus on and give you some kind of, you know, diversity around, you know, looking at different things or being able to explore different sectors. So you know, it's a very privileged job in, in many ways because we can you know, write checks and, you know, get to pick who we think can be winners. But you know, it's kind of the the trade-off that you know, everyone kind of comes into it to a different way. Oftentimes it's usually through having made a company and made a lot of money on that company and then looking to put your money to work afterwards. So that's probably the most common way. Others are, you know, simply folks that started out with, you know, 
2000 pound angel checks and kind of slowly built their portfolio up and made 50 different investments or, you know, had an inheritance and split it up 50 different ways. And, you know, some people are totally grassroots, you know, they become investors that way. And if they're good, then more money comes in. Some people start rich and end up richer. Some people start rich and blow it all, but usually uh, it's access to capital that's usually helpful. And uh, otherwise for us, it was a was basically around the ability to um to raise capital given we worked at funds prior but it must be you know in comparison to founding a, a company that creates something and goes to venture capitalists for money it must be uniquely difficult to set up a venture capitalist firm surely there must be all kinds of complications and things that people wouldn't expect yeah i mean you're basically selling you know it's like doing a pre-seed round for the first 10 years of your of your company. So again, I, I don't expect any sympathy because I don't think VCs necessarily deserve sympathy. But yeah, it, it's a it's a tough product to sell. You have you know a reputation and a track record and you're selling your track record. So it's very hard to enter, especially as a newer a newer manager, because you almost by definition don't have much track record. Now some people may get lucky and have one like home run very early in their career. I mean, I think the the best advice I, I ever heard for venture was, you know, the best thing you can do is to get really lucky in the first couple of years of your career and have some kind of home run because that makes it a lot easier that you know success begets success. But um, yeah, it, it's it's really it's salesmanship on both sides. Like, can you convince investors why you're a trustworthy place for them to put their money? And you know, different investors have different parameters for what they look for. And then from founders, likewise, in in any functioning market, it's you kind of selling yourself to founders around why founders should take your money at your price versus anyone else out there. So it's a real sales job at the end of the, the end of the day. So you're uh you're as good as a car salesman sitting in the lot that there's product, you know, you can go and you know if you can prove you can sell, then you make your commission and if you don't, you don't, you starve. <laughs> and, you know, stakes stakes aren't too high then. <laughs> I just want to clarify something. So the best advice you got was get lucky. Effectively <laughs> Exactly. No, I mean, it's a bit of a piss take, but the, um, no, it, it really is true in this business that I think, you know, success begets success. You know, the more you have markup on your numbers, the better. And, you know, this is a business where the only scorecard is really, frankly, you know, your track record that you carry over your career. So, you know, basically the capital you've invested, how much capital have you returned, both include well, how much have you returned on paper, then most importantly, you know, how much dollar for dollar have you given back to investors so they call that the the kind of dpi you know just the, the the distribution so you know once you've raised your dpi above one that means you know overall you've given back more than your investors have put in so it's really that track record that people look at and so it's hard to do that often because it takes you know usually most funds take 10 years to kind of get to dpi if you're doing early stage investing anyway you know for the most part, whether it's an acquisition or, you know, to have a big enough outcome to say, you know, we've returned the entire fund. Here's your first bit of profit. It takes a long time. So, you know, it's it's much easier if you have an early winner, if you happen to find something that gets super hot, super quick, and then that gets marked up by other investors. You may not have the the DPI number of putting cash back into investors' pockets, but at least on paper, your gains still look pretty good. And there are a lot of people that rode the momentum in the past 10 years. And you know, have great gains. Now, of course, in, in, a, in a tougher market, some of these gains get written down. But it's really, again, you know, during the bull market, it was easy for them to raise because they had great numbers and they kept going out with you know good numbers and playing momentum. If there's one thing people should do when they're looking for investment, and if there's one thing people should not do when they're looking for investment, what would those things be? I mean, to me, the sort of strategy, strategy and tactics. I mean, you know, ideally, I think, you know, the best thing to do really is try and figure out you know who are the right investors for you. So a you know depending on what stage you're at of a company, you know is it going to be angels? Is it going to be high net worths? You know ideally you can you know, build your list of who are the best people that you would want to work with in this space and kind of create a named list. I mean serendipity has its parts in this, but you know I think the the founders that are able to be very self directed and say look I'm doing a SaaS business in DevOps, which means I want to talk to Axel and Hoxton and Crane and Notion. And I we preferably want to talk to the partner who worked on, you know, UiPath at Sequoia, for example. You know, I think you can kind of map out 
depending on stage and sector really well around who are the the best impedance matches, so to speak. I think that's something that not the founders often need a bit of help with is calibrating that because I, I do think that changes the outcome when you're talking to someone who knows your business knows the sector a i think it's just nice having someone that's you know rewarding to talk to versus someone that has no idea what you're doing but then it also you know, i think it helps you you know up your game and then figure out who's going to be the people that are going to move the needle That was Rob Nyes from Hoxton Ventures. Check out standard.co.uk forward slash business for more news, interviews and analysis. How to be a CEO is back on Monday morning. We'd love to see you there.